Leider noch Finas online. Ach, ich glaube, das kann nur. أهلا وسهلا فيكم في مؤسسة عبد المحسن القطان اسمي يزيد عنان مدير البرنامج العام اليوم منرحب في ضيفة بويانا بسكور اللي جاي من لوبليانا جاي من لوبليانا عشان احنا بنشتغل مع بعض على مشروع اللي هو معرض راح يكون هاي السنة بآخر السنة منعرفش بالضبط ايمتا بس هذا المعرض راح يكون حول التضامن بويانا بدي احكي لكم عنها شوي بويانا بسكور هي كيوريتور في او قيمه في متحف الفن الحديث في لوبليانا وقامت بالعمل والشغل على دول عدم الانحياز خاصه الفن كمشروع مشترك مساند المشروع السياسي اللي كان بهذيك الفتره فبيانا مختصة بأرشيف اليوغوسلافي اللي فيه كم هائل من الوثائق والتوثيق للتضامن الفني اللي كان موجود بهذيك الفترة فهي رح تحكي شوي عن هذا الموضوع وبفكر انه هذا هو موضوع كتير بالنسبة للمؤسسة مهم لعدة اشياء لانه هذيك الفترة كمان كانت فترة اللي ظهرت فيها منظمة التحرير ومنظمة التحرير ما كانت ظهرت دون الحراك العالمي دول العالم الثالث بهذيك الفترة فبفكر انه كتير في نقص او شح في المعلومات اللي تربط منظمة التحرير عنا يعني كفلسطينية بالحراك اللي كان يصير بهذيك الفترة وبالتالي اثروا على نشوء منظمة التحرير والتوجهات السياسية اللي كانت بهذيك وكيف تحولت لليوم ولكم بويانا Uh, so I'll leave the floor to you. Uh, I've done the introductions in uh, Arabic. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Yazid. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you also for the invitation uh, to come here to Ramallah, to Palestine. It's a really pleasure to be here. Uh, I will be talking about the non-aligned movement. Um, I will uh, try to give a short uh, overview of the movement, but because the topic is so huge, I structured it in few shorter parts, uh, touching politics or geopolitics, uh, economy, and arts and culture. But I will also depart um, I don't know, trying to, I'm trying to, uh, excuse me, we will continue shortly, just some technical issues. Uh, but anyway, while we are waiting for this, uh, okay, thank you very much. So the first slide. Uh, I will also depart uh, during the talk uh, from the following questions. And the questions are, what was or what is actually the non-aligned movement? And the acronym NAM is used for that, for the non-aligned movement. Um, how much is known about the movement today? And can... NAM still offer some emancipatory visions or potentials as it did in the past. The first slide, uh, this is the world map in 1947. And as you can see, basically all Africa and large parts of Asia are still under colonial rule. And in 1961, this is actually a bit later, but the map was in 61 was more or less the same. In 61, when the first non-aligned uh, movement conference was held in Belgrade, the situation was already different. So many countries were liberated from their colonial regimes or were fighting for the independence. Um, on this image from 1960, you see the so-called five pillars of the non-aligned movement. And this is the meeting they held at the United Nations 
1960, so one year before the actual meeting in Belgrade. And as you see on the image, uh, it's written key, uh, five key neutralist nations. And I have to tell you that at that time, um, they didn't uh, uh, they didn't use the term uh, non-aligned movement yet, but they used terms like neutralist or non-engaged, and then they decided this was really, that these terms had too negative of connotations. So in 1961, they started using the non-alignment. So, but these are the five pillars. Uh, and this is also the 25 um, representative of states in Belgrade, and as you can also see, there's also one woman on the image. This is uh, Srinava Bandanaraike of Sri Lanka, or the rest are men. Um, so what was NAM? The NAM was a transnational political coalition of uh, such states, so mostly they were former col colonies and developing countries from the global south, plus Yugoslavia. As I said, it was formed in 61, in Belgrade, uh, 25 participating countries, and this number had grown to almost 100 members in 1979. And this is also the year uh, when there was, it was considered the peak of the non-aligned movement. Um, the non-aligned movement functioned as a social movement uh, in the international system. So a kind of third way between two blocks also aiming to changing existing global structure and to create more just, equal, and peaceful world order. So it was, uh, in its essence, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-racist movement. Um, and this is the image from the Palace of Federation in Belgrade, where the meeting was held. Unfortunately, you cannot really access that building any longer, just they open it sometimes for the visitors, but it was the place where the first uh, meeting, the first summit was held. The non-alignment, the non-aligned movement also represented this first major disruption in the Cold War map. But while the Belgrade summit was mostly Afro-Asian and Yugoslav project, the movement acquired worldwide dimension with the inclusion of Latin America. But it's also certain that uh, the disappearance, if I can put it like that, from the world's political stage uh, of this movement, of course, is directly linked to rise and victory of neoliberalism. And this is especially the case after 1989. Uh, NAM also supported various uh, national liberation movements across the world, fighting for independence from colonialism and various forms of occupation. So the Palestinian case uh, was not an exception. At the 73 uh, Algeria summit, the PLO was given an observer status in the movement being the, as they put it, legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and their legitimate struggle and at the 1976, this was Colombo summit, the PLO was given at the status of full participant. So as uh, far as I can tell, the question, how they put it, the question of Palestine was an important issue at every single NAM summit since 1961. And the committee for Palestine uh, still exists within the non-aligned movement. So now I will go into this other topic that is economy and geopolitics. And this is really not my um, primary field of research of the non-aligned movement. My primary research is culture and arts and exchanges and networks and new arts uh, production. But I think it's very important to understand also this uh, economy and geopolitics to understand NAM and to understand the whole context of that movement. So, um, how should we start? Okay, the world has shrunk, um, or better, it has shrunk for some, though not for all of its inhabitants in the past decades. And 
mainly because of the globalization and the rapid developments in technology. But this is not something utterly new. It was already predicted by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto more than 150 years ago. Because what they wrote about, they wrote about um, the need for a constantly expanding market for products, for cheap labor, and the growing demand for natural resources. So we can say, of course, colonialism was also a form of globalization. And in this context, um, it's worth reading uh, Samir Amin. I'm sure you're more familiar with this Egyptian Marxist economist and political scientist. Um, his view on globalization, uh, for example, how the old globalization broke down in the late 80s and how the new global monopoly capitalism has taken its place. And I found this image on the internet, which kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. So the neoliberal globalization had generated not only resistance in the South, but elsewhere because, as well because of the huge problems it, it has created. And inequality, of course, is the main one, but also others like uh, ecological problems. But of course, and now I'm coming to the NAM, there was a time when economic, political, and social prospect seems different and more optimistic for the South than they have been in the last few decades. Even though it's very difficult to compare uh, the economies of the South now and then. So we're talking about the period between 1960s and 1980s when the NAM's main focus was on economic and political de development of its member states. And this trend was not only based on creating alternative political alliances, but also, and I think this is really, really uh, very important, also on economic independence from the first world and its institutions. And we know this first world institutions, they are IMF, International Monetary Fund, and GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the World Bank. So these institutions that I just mentioned, they were fiercely attacked by developing countries because of their protectionist practices in favor of the developed countries. So if I give you an example, in 1979, all developing countries in the world, together, they had 30 votes in the IMF. And this is the same number as the United States alone had. So developing countries, 30 votes, United States, 30 votes. So you can understand this logic behind, this unfairness. Uh, another example is the fluctuation of the prices of raw materials in relation to those of industrial products. So again, another example. If we take 1953 index to be at 100, and this index fell by 1973 at under 60, which means that in 1973, almost twice as much raw materials had to be sold, that is exported from the developing countries, than in 1953 for the same quantity of industrial products that of course came from developed countries. Because of such discriminatory treatment, the developing, developing countries and the NAM created UNCTAD. So you can read something about it here. In 1964, where 77, 77 countries formed the G77 group. The first secretary general of the UNCTAD was Raoul Prebich. And he produced a report called towards a new trade policy for development, which is really a kind of manifesto of developing countries. And it's still worth reading today. You can find this manifesto of Raul Prebich on the internet, and it's also in English. So what he did, he provided a critique of Western trade and also aid policies and argued for reforms of the international trading system, which would benefit the developing countries. 
And at the 1973 NAM conference in Algeria, and this is a really important conference, the new international economic order was established. Um, and I'm showing this image because this new international economic order was widely discussed at that time. And this is the booklet, educational booklet that was printed in Yugoslavia. So just to give you an example. And the principles of the new international economic order were, I'm just going to tell you some of those principles, the right to nationalize foreign economic resources, fair prices of raw materials, regulating the activities of multinational companies, providing financial assistance to developing countries, and what they did within this group, they had this eight, where the 0.7% of their gross national income would go to developing countries, but to those ones, was, priority was given to those ones that were the least developed developing countries. So this kind of solidarity fund within this group existed. And if we see this from today's perspective, this new world economic order was a kind of alternative globalization to the first world one, or an attempt of alternative globalization. And all this new constellation subsequently acquired also strong economic dimension and created new spheres of interest and exchange among the countries of the non-aligned movement and the third world. So uh, one example is uh, from Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia created a lot of uh, economic uh, networks within the non-aligned countries. Um, especially with the architecture and urbanist uh, companies. One of them is Energo Project, a uh, construction company, architecture company. So these states, these non-aligned states, these countries, they become allies in the process of trying to articulate how to be modern by one's own rules. That is how to direct one's own modernization process. And this was quite significant because uh, if you read or are familiar with the writing um, of uh, Vijay Prashad, he has this analysis of how the regimes in the new nations, that is this post-colonial states, how they adopted the enlightenment, enlightenment scientific heritage without any discussion of its cultural implication. And he says that was problematic because this kind of machine, of course, was not neutral. Okay, this is uh, further on, but anyhow, this uh, non-aligned networks pretty much collapsed in the late 80s when the global geopolitics changed significantly. The 1980s were also marked by the third world debt crisis, which was a consequence of the 1973 oil crisis. Uh, the oil crisis resulted in sharp uh, rises of interest rates in the third world countries. Consequently, they maximize their exports to meet their debt obligations and the prices of raw materials dropped. So what happened? These countries were then affected. Uh, these countries affected were submitted to structural adjustment by the World Bank and the IMF. And what this means with other words, or simply put, is that these were loans that were conditions by privatization of state-owned industries and resources, imposing free trade, austerity programs, etc. And we have seen since then numerous repetitions of the same financial rescue scenarios in many countries around the world. And consequently, the rise of new forms of dependency, the rise of new forms of colonialism. And um, just to give another example, this is also happening in the region where I come from, in the Balkans. So it means multinational companies entering states and extracting their resources. Um, for example, in Serbia, there is this big case of Rio Tinto company trying to extract lithium from these natural preserve areas. And as uh, Samir Amin says, uh, of course, globalism cannot grow forever because it's not sustainable. And that is why it looks towards uh, fascism 
as a response for its growing weaknesses. And again, this is uh, proven, proven correct to see what is happening around the world and also in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in Hungary, and so on, uh, with this uh, autocratic new regimes. Um, well, unfortunately, the NAM has not provided uh, any alternative plans for the current geopolitical and economic situation. And that has probably been one of its greatest weaknesses in recent years. Like, that's why I was saying a bit of history from the 60s and 70s, that all these alternative mondializations and how they were able to change something. And today, this is just not possible. Um, so, okay, let's skip that. So what has happened was, um, yes, I'm a little bit lost. Uh, so, of course, but also these trade agreements between uh, developing countries, this ratio, it's changed significantly in this uh, past decades. And now, as you see from this graph, uh, the most trade agreements uh, is happening between so-called, of course, they're not anymore developing countries, China, Brazil, India, and the NAM countries that they used to be considered developing, but of course now they are uh, very much developed uh, economies. But all these changes, they, they, did, they did not result, they did not, uh, like, the circumstance was not that the inequalities in less developed countries were lowered, but on the contrary, since 19... 80 income inequalities in those countries have been rising steadily while public expenditures, which means equal access to education, to health, etc., have been declining. Um, and Samir Amin also, again, if I go back to him, he said that we can look back to the non-aligned movement as a possible way of delinking and to delink means to pursue one's own policy. So delinking from current globalization of finding another pattern of globalization, which as he emphasized, does not mean reverting to the old pre-colonial or colonial state, but, um, but bringing new patterns of modernity to third world countries. Of course, the question is what kind of modernity? And he's basically, or was because he died, some years ago, he's basically advocating the kind of political and economic solidarity that once existed within the NAM, but in different, different form of internationalism. And rather than focusing on abstract economic goals, and this is profit maximization, the focus of this new economic activity should be on improvement of life and the reduction of emissions, that is climate change and global warming. Um, the agenda of the NAM in the 60s and 70s was to claim another history, a different modernity and economic development through anti-colonial and anti-imperialist revolution, cooperation and solidarity. And this represented the core of the non-aligned politics. Um, today, the prediction about the future are not uh, optimistic. Global inequality continues to rise despite the strong growth of the less developed economies, as I already mentioned. Um, and I will just um, show this uh, list. This is uh, so-called uh, development assistance and the list of countries uh, uh, and the percentage of their national gross income they put into this uh, development assistance. And you see Sweden's uh, on the top and the country I come from, Slovenia, it's number 22. So this is that part of economy and geopolitics. And I will go now to art and culture um, because significant, significant importance was given to culture in the NAM summit declarations. But even though this topic was never in the foreground, uh, however, words like solidarity, fraternity, equality, peace, fight against imperialism, colonialism, apartheid, they resonated at all NAM summits in the 60s and 70s, but also at UNESCO seminars on culture, at political rallies around the world, in museums. So it seems like that art and politics were united, 
in their quest to create utopian models that would be adapted to social and political changes. So it's no coincidence really that such, such emphasis was put on experimental uh, museology and concept such as uh, integrated museum, social museum, living museum, museum of the workers. So these this concepts are all that were discussed during that time and they were discussed in uh, a lot in the global south. And why, mm, you know, it's also interesting why such importance was placed to museums in those places. And I found um, um, this quote by Justo Meado, he's a writer uh, from Chile. And he said, and that's his quote that I'm going to read. While in other parts of the world, some works by the avant-garde brought into question the legitimacy of museums. But in those places where the history of the museums was incomplete or meeting, missing, the desire for one, that is for a museum, became an absolute imperative. But um, let's go first through some historical uh, facts to better understand the relation between art and politics of that time. And this can also be called um, specific NAM-inspired internationalism. So even before NAM, in 1956, there was a UNESCO conference in New Delhi. And this is right after the 1955 Bandung conference. And interestingly, representatives of the third world or the South, and South here is, of course, is meant as a kind of critical geopolitical entity. They dedicated themselves to promoting alternative routes of cultural exchange that would be different from those in the first and second worlds. And what happened is that the wave of new biennials sprung up in NAM countries. So we have uh, during that, that decades, new biennials in Alexandria, in Medellin, in Havana, in Ljubljana, in Baghdad, for example. And Amil, Amilcar Cabral, that I, I think uh, you know Amilcar Cabral because I spoke to some of you and you mentioned uh, that you watched the film when he was in. Um, so anti-colonial thinker and political leader from Guinea-Bissau, he wrote, people are only able to create and develop the liberation movement because they keep their culture alive despite the continual and organized repression of their cultural life and because they continue to resist by means of culture even when their political and military resistance is destroyed. So that's the end of quote. Um, in 1972, there was another uh, UNESCO seminar uh, organized in Santiago, Santiago, Chile. So uh, this is the time of Salvador Allende, socialist Chile. So at that seminar, museum workers, they discussed new type of social or integrated museum. And this museum would link on one hand, cultural rehabilitation with political emancipation. It would be socially progressive without being ideologically restricted by any political representation. And then there were other conferences, NAM conferences. For example, in uh, Cuba, in Havana in 79, uh, Tito, president of Yugoslavia, he spoke of the resolute struggle for decolonization in the field of culture. And that's uh, why I'm showing this postcard. It's because the emphasis was on questioning intellectual colonialism and cultural dependency. So the idea was not only to study the third world, but actually to make the third world a place from which to speak. So there was another, um, another concept, location, that was, um, that was turned uh, by Enrique Dussel. So location in this context means a horizon beyond modernity, a perspective of one's own cultural experiences. So one common issue that was shared by the NAM states was uh, again the question of cultural imperialism. And there was also a need to create different modernities, so-called epistemologies of the South. Um, the NAM had made cultural equality one of the important principles very early on. That was at the uh, Cairo conference in 64. And this also means uh, it has to do with restitution, meaning that uh, 
that the works of art that were taken or we can say stolen uh, out of their countries during colonial times and put in various museums in New York, London, Paris, they would be returned, regained. Um, and also uh, people who had been denied their culture in the past started to realize the emancipatory role culture played in their lives. So cultural development of the colonizing uh, countries became almost as important as their economic development. So culture uh, was not only um, meant for the elites and art and culture were to be accessible to all. And we could say this was um, a kind of epistemological solidarity. Uh, and then Havana summit in 79 emphasized um, cooperation among non-aligned and developing countries. But then the declarations in the 80s, they focused more specifically on heritage and on communications. So I'm showing this image because one very important um, initiative happened in 1975 in Belgrade, in Yugoslavia. And this was so-called uh, the non-aligned news agency pool. And this, this pool, they called it pool shortly, it functions until the mid nineties. But what it meant that uh, news agencies from non-aligned countries would uh, exchange the information directly. So that means that information from Africa, uh, or what, well, what was going on in Africa would go to, uh, Asian countries and not via Western uh, powerful hegemonic news agencies. So, and uh, this was also uh, the idea was that all this news would be trans trans translated to native languages. So to get rid of this colonial English. So that's that. Um, one important aspect of cultural politics of the NAM was uh, the aspect of solidarity. Uh, solidarity movements and networks in arts and culture, which was uh, especially the case in the 70s, mostly as political engagement against apartheid, imperialism, supporting struggles for independence, and so on. And there's uh, quite some solidarity exhibitions and even museums around the world, but I think you're familiar with some of that. Um, International Art Exhibition for Palestine, which was... Uh, thoroughly researched by Rasha Sarti and Christine Curie, and then was Museo de la Solidaridad, Salvador Allende in Santiago, Chile, and there was Art for People of Nicaragua, the Artist of the World Against Apartheid. There were also solidarity exhibition uh, around Eastern Europe, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, in Eastern Germany, and there was in Belgrade, in Yugoslavia, in 77, the week, so-called the week of Latin America, uh, where, which was dedicated to burning political issues with special focus on Chile. And here is the Brigada Salvador Allende, Chilean Brigade painting a mural in Belgrade. So one, one thing that I just recently discovered because a colleague of mine sent me this image because he knows that I was going to Palestine is the rock concert in support of Palestine, which happened in Belgrade in 1982, where four uh, most popular rock bands of Yugoslavia at that time were playing, and 30,000 people attended. There were some speeches before the concert, representative of the PLO office in Belgrade, and some political politicians of Yugoslavia spoke, but nevertheless, uh, here it is. It says uh, solidarity with the fight, not with struggle, but with the fight of Palestinian nation and their death to fa fascism, freedom to the nation. So which is also this, uh, this expression that they used all the time during the uh, Second World War in Yugoslavia. So, but of course there were also all sorts of other events, institutions, collection, exchanges, artworks and film produced within the NAM and this, uh, that was a topic also of my previous talk here in uh, Katan, uh, so I will not go into detail. But there is, uh, and this is this last part of the presentation, there is one particular topic within the art and culture section uh, that has not really been researched, and but nevertheless deserves some mention. Um, and these are very peculiar 
non-aligned monuments. Not only that there are very few around the world, but they're also quite unusual. So let's look at some of the examples. Um, in 61, in Belgrade, you know, the first conference of the non-aligned movement, and the urbanists and architects were faced with this difficult task to make the city more attractive for, for the foreign guests from all over the world on the occasion of that conference. So among this numer among the numerous proposals, uh, there was a couple of outstanding plans. So one of them was the idea for the uh, creation of a friendship, friendship park in New Belgrade that would be at the confluence of two major Belgrade rivers, Sava and Danube. So the park would have a ceremonial and representative character and would represent a symbol of the struggle for peace and equality for all peoples in the world. And it was officially opened on 7th of September, uh, 61, with a tree planting uh, ceremony of the participants of the conference. Um, and uh, this is 61, and this is now Belgrade, this park, still exists. The trees are still there. Um, so the trees were planted along this prominent 180 meters long Peace Avenue, as it's called. Um, but what is interesting is also the tree species uh, that they used for this occasion. And this is the plane tree, Platanus. And it's Platanus acerifolia, which is a hybrid between two Platanus. It's uh, the hybrid between you know, does it right? <laughs> it's a hybrid of Platanus orientalis, which is oriental plain, and Platanus occidentalis, which is American sycamore. So perhaps I was thinking this particular tree was selected on purpose to symbolically emphasize the non-alignment, uh, non-alignment existed not only in politics, but also in nature. I mean, this is just my guess. I don't know. But uh, the, Belgrade, the Belgrade Park is not the only friendship park in the world. Another one exists in Indonesia, which was inaugurated in 1992 by President Suharto, also in the occasion uh, to commemorate the 10th Non-Aligned Movement Summit. And there, what they have, it's a bit different logic than here in Belgrade, but they have 108 friendship trees planted in the park and trees that were native to the country of each participant in the NAM conference. Uh, so that's the park section. Now we go to monument section. Besides planting trees and designing parks, uh, there have been also a few other sculptural monuments dedicated to non-aligned movement. In Belgrade, in 61, they put up four temporary monuments at various locations in the city, and they were all removed after the conference, with the exception of that um, obelisk, which is uh, 27 meters high. That still exists. Maybe they forgot about it or something. I don't know about the history. Um, so the other obelisk, which is this one, was located in the former Marx and Engels Square and was made, made like a very uh, modern, uh, in this modern way, of steel pipes and neon, and uh, uh, after a couple of days after they put it up, caught on fire, and they had all sorts of other problems with it. But uh, again, no explanation uh, uh, exists why they choose an obelisk as a form to symbolically commemorate the NAM. Because obelisk, as we know, it's been for a long time linked to these uh, imperial aspirations. And um, one example I can think of is this. Uh, Mussolini's obelisk that he put up in 1937 in Rome, but this obelisk was taken, stolen from Ethiopia and was only returned in 2005 to back to Ethiopia. Um, another monument, as you could see, the Belgrade monuments were quite temporary and quite abstract, uh, but that's not the case um, in Jakarta and Georgetown, Guyana, and this is a Guyana monument erected in 72 to honor the four founders of the movement, as well as the NAM conference that was held in uh, Guyana that year. So these are the busts of uh, 
Nasser, Nehru, Kwame Nkrumah, and Tito, and they're char characterized by a re realistic figurative style. And this is the monument in Jakarta. It's called the Non-Aligned Countries Friendship Monument from 92. And this is in Jakarta, and it's rather strange. As you can see, it's a postmodern globe-shaped monument supported by a fountain with five pigeons in the center, symbolizing, as they put it, togetherness, peace, and spirit. Well, it seems that monuments haven't really worked favorably for the non-aligned movement. And the movement was to stimulate different uh, kinds of modernities, progressive ideas in arts as well. But the remaining monuments can't be said to embody that vision, really. So they were obsolete already at the time they were erected, with the exception of the abstract temporary public sculptures in Belgrade. So for the end, I show these two slides always. Um, can the non-aligned contemporaneity be a relevant political, economic, and cultural perspective today? And this question should not be considered as some kind of exoticism linked to the past, nor should it harbor nostalgia of the movement itself. And as we know, many NAM states were quite far, if I can say it that way, from the principles the movement promoted. And that's the last slide. So while I believe it's, it's extremely important to focus on the historical heritage of the non-aligned movement, I also believe that in the current political situation, we should, in the next step, move attention beyond the research based solely on the NAM historical role, beyond the aspect of solidarity as once was to today's situation and to propose a more radical agenda, an agenda that could be based, among other things, also on some of the NAM emancipatory ideas. And that's why I'm showing these two slides. This is some ideas that could be discussed and maybe used and maybe applied to something. So how this could be done, of course, is a challenge and perhaps a horizon that reminds us of a past where economic, political, and social prospect seems different and more optimistic than they have been in the last few decades. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your very, very interesting. I mean, a lot of things I haven't been aware of, especially. I mean, the last part of the obelisks uh, seems to me like it's uh, an empty, like it's 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 not, not complementary to the to the idea of. Uh, the NAM uh, philosophy and ideologies because of their grand and well, how do you explain this? How, how did this happen? Can you hear me? Yeah, I have no idea to tell to be honest because I've been trying to find more information about that and you cannot even find the name of the authors of that obelisk. I have no idea really why would they use that? I was trying to find the information but I mean, it's contradictory, you're right. Yeah. It, it has a militaristic kind of... Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's another thing that I would like to address the audience here. Uh, two days ago, we lost uh, one of the main people who were behind the Solidarity Exhibition, International Exhibition in uh, Beirut, Mona Saudi. And I would like to remember her because of the initiative that was uh, done at the time it was a very important initiative and then followed up by the work that has been done by Rasha Salti and uh, uh, Genevieve, uh, uh, Christine um, uh, Houri. So it's, it's opportune to think of those people who uh, at that time were very engaged with the NAM movement and the NAM ideologies and to link Palestine with, with that movement. Uh, just a word of... Uh, Good, good thinking about uh, Mona. 
Um, and I have a question to you, Vera, actually. Uh, how much artists at that time were aware of their relationship to that kind of South Alliance and uh, how much these values of uh, that you've been practicing, which is really actually par part of what other artists were practicing in other Nam countries. So how does this relate, uh, this history relate to the art practice in Palestine? Uh, Palestinians in general, yani also in diaspora? I, th I think the awareness was, was more so in the diaspora than it was here. I think here it was the, the practice of survival, of, of trying to establish something on the ground, of trying to prove this, that there is an art movement without really, and of the opposition to occupation, without uh, really without having clarity about the link between the, the, what is happening in the world and the non alive movement. Of course, the, the artists, most of the artists who had emerged in the 70s, I wouldn't say they were politicized, but they were very Palestinian and national in their thinking, but they were not politicized on a global kind of uh, matter. But I think, I would think people like uh, Kamal, Kamal Bullata and and Smail Shamut and people who are living outside Palestine, I think they were very engaged with, the, with these issues and, and these matters. Uh -huh. um, can I, can I uh, say, uh, Ismail Shamut, you mentioned uh, the name of the painter. And um, I was uh, researching also the diplomatic gifts. For example, the representatives of the PLO were giving to President Tito, and one of the diplomatic gifts was the painting by uh, this author, Ismail Shamut. Yes, it's in Museum of Yugoslavia in Belgrade. Plus the two exhibitions that he opened also in, uh, in Bulgaria. Now, in, what was it? In I think it was in Budapest, and Budapest, he opened yes. the exhibition in 71 in Belgrade. It was called Palestinian Art, and this uh, exhibition included... Uh, ethnographic works, children uh, drawings, and contemporary works. But unfortunately, just two newspaper clips, a very short one, exist about this exhibition. It's very difficult to find information. I have one of the catalogs. We ordered it. Uh, but the question, how, how much the uh, exchange of Palestinian art, art and artists within the bigger biennials, and uh, uh, c can you tell us a little bit about that? Artists, yani, were there Palestinian artists as part of that NAM exchange, bigger biennials? Well, you know, you have to you have to take into consideration what which were actually the NAM uh, uh, the NAM cultural events because there were other events that included artists from uh, say from the south, but they were not part of the NAM. Maybe some NAM ideas resonated there, but within the NAM there was really just one um, one institution uh, that uh, created a collection of works from artists from the Nam countries. And this collection, if you have a chance ever to be in that country, that country is called Montenegro today, of course, that was Yugoslavia before. And this was um, a so-called gallery of the art of non-aligned countries and it was established in the 80s. And the idea was very good to have artists from all these countries come to Montenegro to create, to be in residences, to, they produce some documentary films, they produce some seminars, some educational activities, and they have over 1,500 works. They have some works from Palestine, but not visual artists. They were uh, older works. Um, so Palestinian artists, artists from Palestine, um, <laughs> it's very difficult. Because within this NAM frame, um, different kind of events, different kind of, uh, different kind of uh, biennials, uh, exhibitions. And the ones I know, it's very sporadically that I could find uh, the name of Palestinian. Uh, um. Yes, yes. And there's also the exchange um, of... Um, artists between, for example, Yugoslavia and those countries. And the, well, Yugoslavia was giving a lot of scholarships for people from Palestine and from Iraq and so on. And there's quite some artists came to study in Yugoslavia and some are still living there. Well, Jana, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your talk today. I think it's, I'm really happy that it's recorded because this will give me the chance to revisit uh, some of the rich uh, information that you shared with us. I think I want to back away a little bit from the questions about art in Palestine, and, and I, I want to try to 
uh, uh, poke a few things in the direction of where we are today. So I think you, you did a great job describing to us the, the dynamics, both economic and political, that existed in the 60s and 70s that allowed uh, uh, for these kind of solidarity networks between states to exist. Um, but after the fall of the USSR, um, and after that fall of the political ideology of communist socialist uh, practice in governance, um, and fast forward 30 years, or 40 years, uh, 30 years, um, how can we look at solidarity today, given that we exist in a, in a purely neoliberal uh, economic system? So what, what kind of ruptures would we have to find uh, uh, to, to rethink our um, relationship to solidarity? or to these networks, and how could they exist without the backing of political force, so without the force of, of states uh, or, or state institutions, how can global solidarity look like? I realize also it, it could be a broad question, so you can... Uh, but that is, I mean, this is the right question, and the question of solidarity has been discussed uh, widely in the past years, especially with uh, pandemics. You know, what kind of solidarity are we talking about? Is it a state-supported solidarity? Is it this solidarity that has, uh, um, that is linked to this white savior complex? Uh, how to, for example, the question of how to decolonize solidarity is often on the agenda of such uh, or similar discussions. And, uh, you know, to be really honest, I don't know. That's something that we discussed, I mean, what is solidarity? What kind of solidarity are we talking about? Maybe we should look at just this really, how to put it, bottom-up uh, initiatives and look for solidarity there before we look at this larger picture and all this uh, state-supported uh, solidarity project that's once existed. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. I mean... Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is um, currently it's, it's very clear that, that there is no antithesis to neo, neoliberal capitalist um, econo economies. Um, and, and it seems to me that there would have to be some kind of political foundation, ideological foundation, that allows for like transnational mobilization. Um, and, or perhaps where maybe my, my direction to it is mistaken. Perhaps it is a localities, micro, um, micro community solidarities. Um, like, 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 if I relate to uh, nature, it's like seeds, maybe. But uh, again, if we think of solidarity as some kind of larger project, you know, we live in this neoliberal uh, world. So any kind of uh, project that is uh, related to solidarity, I think it gets um, encapsulated very soon by the system, right? So maybe it's, it has to be out of this map. So l let me let me uh, try to to put more. On it. I think some of us here watched the film and we had a few discussions uh, after that last film about Cuba. And, and we, we were analyzing how the, the set of social values that the Cubans at the time embodied um, uh, pushed them to make moves like sending 300,000 troops to Africa. So there was, there was this ideological sort of drive um, behind these, these uh, uh, actions of solidarity. Um, and in the absence of this, like, global universal set of s value systems, right, it seems that the left is in disarray. So, um, so I think I'm trying to understand how we can look at global solidarity through that. Um, uh, I may go back to Shuru's comment in, uh, in that film. Uh, Shuru was, I mean, if we look at solidarity from, not from a leftist perspective, if we look at solidarity now, from the right wing and the the other side, the extremity from from that, I think there is some solidarity, right wing solidarity and success. There are there are, I mean, the values of the right is thriving and it's uh, uh, it's everywhere now. And uh, I think there is a right wing solidarity now. I mean, it's the reversal of the left. So we have to look at solidarity from the right perspective, maybe we can see a different word with a different sort of uh, global solidarity. But, but it seems that right-wing solidarity is very linked to neoliberal capitalist, uh, which is already in hegemony. So the question is, how do we look at the left then? 
um, maybe, I mean, it's the same as the right when the left thrived. Personally, I don't have any answers or anything. <laughs> but I, I think what I found super refreshing uh, and at, you, from what you said, and also it was echoed somehow in the films that we've been watching uh, in Russia's program, that I forgot that I took for granted that internationalism and globalism just mean one thing, right? And so actually what's inspiring, because I'm kind of like stuck on the last notes the two slides uh, that you mentioned and uh, like not to be nostalgic and how like it, it's not a nostalgic look to the past and we can't actually repeat those things but what i find refreshing about revisiting them and like having hearing you talk is that you know to question a lot of uh, these terms that i thought were that had a universal meaning and i i found that helpful the other thing i also i find myself um looking at is the link, the link the question of common heritage outside of museums and you said to migrants, for example. And I wondered if you want to talk, Yannick, can you elaborate also about that a bit more? Um, maybe I should explain, but this two, uh, last two slides that I show is a collection of thoughts and ideas that were um, collected uh, from the various discussions and seminars where we discussed the NAM. So all these proposals are something that could be related to NAM's ideas from the past, but also observed in this new light in today's contemporary situation. Um, and um, you're right, uh, it's very important also to think out of museum walls um, and how to, for example, the, um, how you say, the, the link from the concept that we take for granted. Uh, and another concept, one is solidarity that I mentioned, another that also constantly reappeared in my research on the name is humanism. I mean, can we still talk about humanism the same way as we talked or as they talked 50, 40, 30 years ago? And that here is, I think it's one yeah, broader solidarity with non-humans. And this is also very important uh, discussions are going on around the world. Of course, it's sometimes when we talk, they say, some people say, and I think all the opinions are, you know, very valuable. This kind of opinions and this kind of opinions, they say, but how can we talk about non-humans if, if the problems with humans is not being solved, right? But I think we should go beyond that. We should be open that this kind of perspective exists. And if we think about non-humans and humans, that's like we think about the world. So, and... Uh, just to go back then to the um, monuments that were made, it's funny that the non-human forms uh, that are exactly. the ones who survived. That's, that, yeah, that's, that was for me was really uh, revealing to, uh, to start thinking about these parks and the trees and what kind of trees they choose, you know, and why they didn't just choose like they did in Jakarta later on, why didn't just choose some huge monument, but trees. I think it's a really nice idea. And it's like, these are the seeds of the map. Now this, as you could see, these are huge trees. With a Canadian group, it's called Pandemic Gardens. And it engages a lot of artists within the, especially during the COVID uh, period and period where, where social interaction and cultural interaction was stopped is to go out to nature and, and do do activities that engage people with, with nature and with oneself. So there's a, an online exhibition presently, you might find it online, called Pandemic Gardens, and it's very, very interesting to, to look at. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, you mentioned something about museums, and now we're in a debate about the role of museums here in Palestine, because for the last 15 years, there has been a mushrooming of uh, museums. Uh, basically, basically, it started to, to preserve our cultural heritage from being um, uh, taken away or, or uh, uh, hijacked by, by the Israelis. This, is, this was the idea of having museums. And now there's the, the concept of contemporary museums come, coming into action with, the, with, with ideas that uh, sometimes are not near 
to the people uh, this this issue about elitism 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 uh, and the social and political uh, versus the social and political it's a very interesting issue because we're in transition now and we're we're trying to establish something i think there should be a broader debate about uh, this in palestine uh, you mentioned something about the workers museum uh, could you tell us a little bit about that yeah um this was especially uh, discussed in the socialist countries because you know everything belongs to the people including museum uh and it was also discussed in santiago chile at that seminar uh, with the new government, with the socialist Allendas Chile, and they uh, had this initiative uh, for Museum of Solidarity. So uh, Allende said in one of the speeches that this would be the Museum of the Workers, and he had especially in mind the miners from Chile. So he uh, that meant that museums would be for everybody, including the miners. But uh, uh, museums of the workers were part of the cultural politics of former Yugoslavia. So what was happening, again, with this idea, art should be accessible to all. Everyone should, should have the possibility to visit museum. If they cannot, the museum would go to them. So what they did, they, they uh, organized exhibitions in factories. Uh, they, were, they had seminars, uh, cinema clubs, uh, poetry courses, etc., etc. It was very, very rich uh, uh, era, very rich decades for such uh, production. Uh, I want to add a little bit also on that. Uh, remember Jack's book, uh, Jack, that has been uh, researching the museum in Pal museums in Palestine, and there are 55 museums, and mostly smaller museums in villages and uh, small towns. And if you look at the collection of these museums, mostly it's folkloric, uh, art, you know, folkloric art, uh, or uh, artifacts uh, that uh, is more related to farming, a relationship to the land, archaeological uh, findings as well. You can see that. So museums are, uh, let's say, uh, all over uh, the geography. And uh, but then, I think also there's a centricity to how we discuss museums. Vera, you know, we think that our discussion on the Palestinian museums or what is a contemporary museum really relates to what uh, what the normal, the people think about what a museum is. And they have it, and they do it more often. I mean, if you go to villages, maybe uh, Riwaq Fida has been to so many of the villages, and she knows that people want uh, these archaeological uh, folkloric museums, and they do it, Yanni. Yeah, exactly. And we think that the capital M is the important one, but then... Uh, the smaller M's are everywhere. It's also very much linked with rom romanticization of, of your cultural heritage. And rather than keeping it alive, it's just putting it in a corner and, and, and uh, displaying it. The museization of culture is very debatable in this case. But then what is the museum of the people? This is it. Yeah, this is the museum of the people, if we want to go back to the definition. So... Um, Right. Thank you so much, Boyana, and uh, hopefully we can continue uh, later the conversations maybe in, uh, in the restaurant. Thank you. Thank you.